An investigation is underway into an apartment fire in the Bronx that injured five people. And a tragic end to the year after two deadly fires in the Soundview section of the Bronx just hours apart. As CBS 2's Ashos Bedrosian reports, tonight families are salvaging their belongings instead of celebrating the new year. Bronx Chopper 2 overhead as firefighters battled a massive blaze there impacting several businesses. And you can see the smoke was still coming through the roof. Well, you couldn't really tell the extent of the damage from this fire until you got to the the back of these homes. Take a look at this one completely burned. This is where the fire. Welcome to the Rich Havit channel. Today we delve into the world of firefighting, exploring the complexities of emergency response systems and the challenges faced in combating fires, as exemplified by the tragic Bronx fire of January 2022. Stay tuned as we examine the measures taken to mitigate fire hazards in high-rise buildings and the coordinated efforts required to ensure the safety of residents and firefighters alike. On January 9, 2022, in New York City, residents of a 120-unit housing complex are experiencing cold temperatures. This particular apartment, 3N, spanning the second and third floors, relies on a malfunctioning space heater for supplemental heating dangerously positioned next to a flammable mattress. The building's primary defense mechanism, rudimentary fire alarms, is activated, but their effectiveness is compromised due to a history of false alarms. Consequently, only a few residents react promptly to the alarm, heading towards the fire escapes. The first 911 call reporting a wall of black smoke emanates from apartment 3N at 1054, followed rapidly by multiple calls from neighboring units. This coordinated sequence prompts Bronx firefighters to arrive at the scene within three minutes. However, the succession of calls from specific units signals a catastrophic failure of the building's secondary fire defense system. Unlike in the past, high-rise buildings rarely succumb to fires, with families often able to return shortly after incidents. Understanding why this occurs begins with firefighting methods and starts with construction practices. If there's one thing synonymous with New York City housing, it's the legacy of early 1900s progressive housing reform. External fire escape routes are iconic features serving various purposes from makeshift sleep spots to patios and flower beds. However, high-rise buildings like the Twin Parks Northwest, constructed in 1972, do not have such escapes due to regulations banning them four years prior. Despite lacking external fire escapes, high-rise buildings like Twin Parks Northwest are not defenseless against fires. Fireproof construction, a mandatory technique for high-rises, traces its origins back to early housing reform documents, initially requiring buildings five stories or higher to be constructed with incombustible materials Modern building codes have evolved to ensure fire resistance through materials testing and adherence to detailed construction standards. New York City's fire protection system relies on various measures, including fireproof construction and detailed building codes. Every apartment is required to have fireproofing notices and instructions for tenants. Although the term fireproof may be somewhat exaggerated since most contents within apartments are flammable. Building codes specify materials, fixtures, and layouts to ensure adequate fire resistance, addressing issues like wall penetrations and gaps that could allow fire to spread. Specific regulations, such as Section 714, dictate requirements for penetrations through walls, ensuring fire-resistant seals and materials meet industry standards. Similarly, guidelines govern window sizes relative to neighboring buildings to minimize fire spread risk. Overall, adherence to these regulations ensures buildings are equipped to resist and contain fires effectively. If the neighboring building is closer, regulations regarding sprinklers and fire drapes come into play, determining the allowance of windows. Despite the intricate and specific nature of fire-resistant building regulations, the fundamental principle revolves around compartmentation in multifamily dwellings and high-rise apartments. Compartmentation aims to minimize disaster by preventing fire spread, typically effective in containing minor fires within individual units. However, the failure of compartmentation in the Bronx fire 
led to a tragic escalation from a single apartment accident to a catastrophe. While fire-resistant walls, floors, and ceilings contained the fire within apartment 3N initially, the failure of doors allowed the fire to spread. In high-rise emergencies, the efficacy of fire doors is crucial for minimizing damage and ensuring resident safety. Consequently, New York's building codes extensively cover opening protectives, emphasizing regular testing and maintenance. During the Bronx Fire, the swift succession of 911 calls indicated a major problem, suggesting smoke and fire containment failure. Despite recommendations for residents to stay in their units during fires, the compromised compartmentation forced some to contemplate risky escapes. Throughout history, fireproof construction, fire-resistant materials, and compartmentation have prevented apartment fires from engulfing entire structures and saved countless lives. As residential buildings continue to soar to greater heights, modern high-rises incorporate various protective measures. Vertical standpipes facilitate firefighters' access to pressurized water throughout the building, eliminating the need to haul hoses up multiple flights of stairs. Stair pressurization systems are employed to push fresh air down stairwells, aiding in smoke suppression. Additionally, sprinkler systems, now mandatory in newer constructions, act as an initial line of defense against fires, often rendering compartmentation unnecessary. However, many older high-rises, particularly those at high risk, were constructed before such technologies and regulations were in place. These buildings rely on traditional design methods and swift emergency responders for protection. Regardless of the building's height, the scale of the fire, or its location, a standardized response system is activated upon the first 911 call. With approximately 60,000 fire stations across the U.S., each uniquely tailored to its area of responsibility, they form a dense network crucial for prompt emergency response. For instance, if a fire were to occur at a single-family home located on the outskirts of the greater Denver area, the nearest firefighters would likely be stationed at South Metro Fire Station 40. In comparison to other stations within the department's district, Station 40 serves a sparsely populated area and operates primarily as an engine company. An engine company, such as Station 40, is equipped with a fire engine as its main apparatus. Fire engines are designed to be the first responders to a fire incident, being smaller, more maneuverable, and stocked with basic firefighting equipment such as water, foam, hoses, and ladders. With 23 out of South Metro's 29 stations housing fire engines, they can typically respond to incidents within an impressive average time of around eight minutes. On the other hand, the remaining six stations within the department are equipped as truck companies, housing fire trucks. These larger apparatuses are manned by more experienced firefighters and are equipped with specialized tools for advanced firefighting techniques and rescue operations. Fire trucks are particularly valuable for accessing elevated positions and performing aerial rescues. While it may take longer for a fire truck from a station like Station 18 to reach the incident location, Station 40's engine is capable of initiating firefighting efforts to contain or mitigate the fire until additional resources arrive. However, the location of the fire presents a unique risk, especially during dry, drought-stricken Colorado summers, where the surrounding brush is highly flammable. In such conditions, a small spark or ignition source could quickly escalate into a devastating brush fire. In fact, in 2021, several miles to the north, a combination of high winds, unextinguished embers, and a sparking power line ignited a brush fire that raised over a thousand buildings, marking the most destructive fire in the state's history. Considering Station 40's location on the suburban outskirts, it serves as the base for a brush engine equipped to navigate off-road terrain through hills prone to brush fires. Additionally, Station 40 hosts a water tender to supply thousands of gallons of water to areas lacking hydrants. If the fire were in a different location, such as the small town of Debec, Colorado, the responding station would be the single station serving the area. Despite its small size, it houses a similar complement of engines, trucks, brush engines, and a water tender under one roof for efficient response. Upon receiving a call, the dispatcher would classify the fire's severity, 
typically as a one-alarm fire, prompting a predetermined response composition. Engine Company 40 would lead the response, with its captain assuming the role of incident commander until command transfer. The initial commander would relay a scene size-up report to incoming units, detailing the situation and issuing instructions. As the incident escalates, a battalion chief arrives, assuming command and determining the firefighting strategy, offensive or defensive. Offensive strategy involves entering the structure to search for victims and fight the fire from inside, while defensive strategy prioritizes external containment to prevent further spread, especially when the building's structural integrity is compromised. Safety officers ensure risk management aligns with departmental protocols, emphasizing the importance of paired firefighters, charged hoses, and rapid intervention crews stationed outside for rescue. While some firefighters may debate tactics like charging hoses with water based on their discretion, adherence to safety protocols remains paramount to mitigate risks effectively. A fire incident can become too dangerous to manage due to various factors such as rapid spread, lack of progress, or insufficient resources. The incident commander, guided by the safety officer's recommendations, ultimately determines when the structure is beyond saving and transitions firefighting efforts from offensive to defensive mode. Defensive mode, though not ideal, focuses on minimizing collateral damage, especially if the chances of a successful rescue are deemed too risky for firefighters. In defensive mode, firefighters primarily combat the fire from the outside, prioritizing containment and protecting nearby structures from exposure. Additionally, a collapse zone is established to safeguard against structural instability. While a single-family home fire is relatively straightforward, numerous variables can complicate firefighting efforts. For example, if the fire were in an area without fire hydrants, like rural locations, water supply becomes a major concern. Water tenders shuttle water from hydrants to the fire site to ensure a continuous supply. Larger buildings pose even greater challenges as they provide more fuel for the fire and necessitate a more extensive response. In densely populated areas like downtown Denver, multiple fire departments may respond under mutual aid agreements. However, coordinating responses among different agencies can be chaotic without a unified system. The National Incident Management System establishes common protocols, terminology, and communication channels to ensure interoperability among emergency response organizations nationwide. Whether responding to a small incident or a large-scale emergency, the principles of firefighting remain the same, albeit on a larger scale. However, breakdowns in the system, like the Bronx Fire in January 2022, can result in tragic outcomes despite significant firefighting efforts. Despite advancements in firefighting techniques, such tragedies underscore the importance of maintaining a robust and integrated emergency response system. Thank you for joining us for exploring that effective fire prevention and response strategies are crucial for safeguarding lives and property in residential buildings, especially high-rise complexes. By understanding the complexities of firefighting methods, building regulations, and emergency response protocols, we can work towards minimizing the risk of catastrophic incidents like the Bronx Fire. Please don't forget to give it a like and subscribe to our channel for more amazing content. Your support means everything to us, and we can't wait to bring you more videos on our channel.